All right. Can you see my screen? Perfectly well. Great. Um, all right. So yes, uh, thank you very much uh, to the organizers um, for putting together this super interesting program. Uh, so I'll be talking about this question of why some bacterial, bacterial genes, including antibiotic resistance genes, seem to be found on plasmids rather than uh, the chromosome. Uh, so this is all uh, theoretical results, just to warn you beforehand. Um, so the work, so where the work here um, was motivated by this observation that there seems to be a trend uh, in the types of genes that are present on plasmids versus the chromosome. So here, for example, I'm showing you data on the proportion of chromosomes versus plasmids. Um, that So the proportion of DNA on chromosomes versus plasmids uh, that code for antibiotic resistance genes. Um, and it seems that there is indeed this effect where antibiotic resistance is overrepresented um, on plasmids. Uh, of course, there's um, caveats to this sort of data, um, notably um, sort of biases that might exist in the databases um, that you use for this type of analysis. Um, but nevertheless, there seems to be a consensus that typically certain types of genes uh, including antibiotic resistance, virulence factors, heavy metal to tolerance, and bacteriocin systems are overrepresented uh, on plasmids. Um, and there is a, a considerable body of uh, work that has considered this question. Uh, and much of the theoretical work around this idea um, mainly fo focuses on this um, trade-off between horizontal transfer and segregation loss. Uh, so the idea is that uh, the advantage for a gene of being on a plasmid uh, is that it can be horizontally transferred, uh, but then the disadvantage is, is that it, its plasmids are less um, stably inherited than the chromosome, so you get this segregation loss effect where sometimes you lose the plasmid and therefore the gene. Um, more recently, there's been some really nice work that has looked at the uh, effect of uh, having multiple copies of the plasmids uh, and what that means um, uh, for the types of genes uh, that end up on plasmids versus the chromosome because of these um, uh, genetic dominance effects uh, that come into play when you have this type of polypody. Um, but the work that I'll be presenting today is very firmly in uh, this kind of first type of tradition where we're thinking of uh, low copy number uh, plasmids and really kind of in this framework of thinking about horizontal transfer versus segregation loss. Um, and to sort of summarize the key ideas uh, from this body of work, um, as we sort of, as was discussed in great and interesting detail in the, in the previous talk, um, there is this idea that uh, essential genes tend to be on the chromosome, although I was interested to hear that not always. Um, and this is because if a, if a gene is essential um, and plasmids are uh, subject to segregation loss, then we'd expect to see very uh, beneficial genes locate on the chromosome. Uh, there is also this idea that uh, public goods end up on plasmids. Uh, because this is uh, potentially a way to enforce cooperation. So if you have uh, the trait that goes for the public good and it can be horizontally transferred, uh, then you prevent the emergence of cheetahs. Um, although some of these ideas are um, still up to debate. Um, and then most relevantly for antibiotic resistance, uh, there is this idea that uh, genes that code for locally beneficial traits end up on plasmids. Um, this idea was proposed 
uh, a while ago, and then it was developed in a really lovely modeling paper by Bergstrom et al. Um, so the, the premise of this work was this idea that plasmids are too costly and not transmissible enough uh, to persist as pure parasites. So that reflected um, what was known about plasmid biology at the time. Uh, so under this assumption, uh, looking at a closed population, um, you've, the, the authors find that any trait that is beneficial will end up on the chromosome because of this segregation loss effect, uh, and then that leads to the loss of the plas plasmid. Uh, so uh, in essence, in a closed population, beneficial traits are always on the chromosome and the plasmid is lost. Uh, and this um, um, led to this idea of the plasmid paradox. So plasmids can only persist if they carry beneficial traits, but if the tra traits are beneficial, uh, they go on the chromosome. So uh, how do plasmids happen? Um, and the solution that these authors propose is that if we consider a locally beneficial trait um, and an influx of cells that firstly don't have that trait and secondly don't have that plasmid, then the advantage of being able to pass the trait onto the incoming cells via horizontal gene transfer allows the trait to be maintained on the plasmid, and then that allows uh, the plasmid uh, to be maintained it itself in the population. And hence this idea that, um, uh, that uh, plasmids encode for locally beneficial traits. Um, however, uh, this work really was premised on the assumption that plasmids have uh, too high a cost and too low a, tra uh, a transfer rate to persist as um, parasites. And more recently, there's uh, lots of emerging evidence that uh, makes this assumption quite questionable. Uh, so uh, firstly, um, transfer rates appear to be higher than, than what was measured at the time, in particular, um, transfer rates in biofilms uh, are higher than in liquid cultures. Um, the uh, um, fitness cost of plasmids is uh, known to decrease through compensatory evolution. Um, and there is uh, experimental evidence uh, suggesting that parasitic plasmids uh, can indeed persist. Uh, and finally, there is also uh, gymonomic evidence uh, showing that the same plasmid uh, backbone can exist with variable gene content. Uh, so taken together, um, all this evidence suggests that there is a need to revisit um, the question of why certain uh, genes are on plasmids, taking in, into account this the presence of this gene-free version of the plasmid. Um, so uh, this is the work that I'm presenting here. Uh, and now I'm shifting and I'll be talking specifically about antibiotic resistance, um, but note that the results uh, also hold, hold for um, other genes with similar properties. Um, so I'm developing here a model where I um, uh, look at competition between six different uh, cell types. So the large circle represents uh, the chromosome. Uh, so this chromosome can either carry the resistance gene marked with R um, or not, in which case the chromosome is considered sensitive. Um, and then the cells can either have a resistant uh, version of the, uh, of the plasmid here shown in uh, small circles, um, no plasmid at all, or a sensitive version of the plasmid. Um, and so I model um, multiple processes uh, here. I'm not going to go into the details uh, of these processes uh, because the results that I present are robust to how I'm modeling them. But essentially, I'm looking at a uh, 
logistic growth model. So uh, there is replication and uh, cell death and some sort of carrying capacity. Um, the plasmids uh, can transmit between uh, cells uh, and can be lost through segregation loss. And then if there is, uh, if the cell carries no resistance, it is subject to an additional uh, death rate from antibiotic exposure. Um, and we also assume that both the resistance gene and the plasmid have a fitness cost. Uh, so if you have either version of the plasmid, uh, you have a cost that is just associated with the plasmid backbone. Um, if you have uh, the uh, resistance, you chromosomal resistance, you um, are subject to a fitness cost. Um, if you have plasmid borne resistance, you're subject to, the fit to a fitness cost, which we assume is the same uh, as the fitness cost of the chromosomal version. Um, and then importantly, um, if you have both, uh, resist both chromosomal and plasmid uh, versions of the resistance gene, uh, you are uh, paying both fitness costs. Um, and then the question that we are interested in answering is, uh, when is plasmid born versus chromosomal resistance evolutionary stable? Uh, so what I mean by evolutionary stable here is uh, that can one form of resistance be invaded by the other? So here uh, in the top case, uh, the green version cannot be invaded by the orange, so it is stable. And in the bottom version, introducing the orange into the green population allows the um, orange to take over. So the green is evolutionary and stable. Um, so here I am looking at evolutionary stability of the two forms of resistance as a function of antibiotic pressure. So this is the, the, the additional death rate for the sensitive cells uh, and cost of resistance. Um, so in this white zone, I don't see any resistance. So, so here the population is sensitive. Uh, and then there is this very small blue zone uh, where only plasmid borne resistance is stable. Um, this area is uh, very sensitive to parametrization and also sensitive to um, uh, model structure, so I won't be talking about that in detail. So the two main outcomes uh, in this model are this orange show, uh, zone, where only chromosomal resistance is evolutionary stable. So uh, in this zone, if um, plasmid borne resistance is the only form of resistance uh, available, uh, the population will have plasmid borne resistance. But as soon as I introduce chromosomal resistance, uh, that will take over the population. Uh, and then once chromosomal resistance is, is established, it cannot be invaded by plasmid borne resistance. So that's the orange zone. And then in this pink zone, I observe bi-stability. Uh, so what that means is that uh, if chromosomal, if chromosomal resistance has been established, it cannot be invaded by plasmid borne resistance. Um, but similarly, if plasmid borne resistance has been established, it cannot be invaded by chromosomal resistance. So uh, in this parameter space, uh, resistance genes can either be on the chromosome or the plasmid, uh, dependent on initial conditions. And we'll talk about that um, a little in a little in more detail in a little bit. Um, so to um, understand this question of chromosomal resistance uh, parameter space versus the bistable parameter space in more detail, uh, we can look at how different model, uh, changing different model parameters affects uh, which uh, space we're in. Uh, so I won't go into these uh, results in detail, uh, but to summarize, um, we see chromosomal resistance as the 
only possible outcome when the benefit from resistance is high, so when the uh, antibiotic associated mortality is high or the cost of resistance is low. Uh, we see it when plasmid fitness is low, so when the transmission rate uh, is low or the cost of the plasmid is high or the segregation loss is high. Uh, and we see it when cell density is low, uh, which essentially means there's less uh, plasmid transfer. Um, and then conversely, uh, we see this by stability, so either a form of resistance being possible uh, when the benefit from resistance genes is low uh, and when the plasmid fitness is high. Um, so I said that in this by stable zone, which form you eventually see will depend on the initial conditions. Uh, so here uh, I am uh, looking at exactly that. Um, so uh, these are the results of a simulation where I start off the population with a mix of sensitive and resistant uh, cells. So and on the x-axis, uh, I'm varying the uh, frequency of the sensitive plasmid in the sensitive population. And on the y-axis, I'm varying um, whether the um, a resistant population is mostly made up of a chromosomal resistance or sensitive resistance. Um, and so there's two effects that I want to talk about here. So there's this effect that um, high initial frequencies of the uh, sensitive plasmid um, benefit chromosomal resistance uh, and thus frequency dependence um, where high um, initial values of uh, plasmid borne resistance benefit plasmid borne resistance. Uh, so to start with, uh, let's look at the effect of the sensitive plasmid. Um, and, and this is interesting because um, right at the beginning, we talked about this local adaptation idea uh, being dependent on the absence of the sensitive plasmid. So now that we see this effect where the sensitive plasmid being present um, is advantageous for chromosomal resistance, it's worth revisiting that local adaptation hypothesis. Um, so the, at the top, um, we're looking at the scenario that was modeled in the Bergstrom paper where the influx of cells into this local population uh, don't have a version of the plasmid. Uh, and now I am looking at what happens if we actually assume that these incoming cells that don't have the resistance gene do have a sensitive plasmid. Um, so here I am showing you exactly this variation on the x-axis. Um, so looking, at, so I'm modeling a local population where resistance is beneficial and then cells coming from the outside that don't have resistance. Um, and again, see here, the blue corresponds to uh, plasmid borne resistance and the orange to chromosomal resistance as the outcome of the model. Um, and what we see here is that indeed, under the assumption where the incoming cells don't have um, the sensitive uh, plasmid, then having this influx is um, beneficial for uh, plasmid borne resistance uh, and allows the gene to be on the plasmids. But as soon as I start having uh, plasmids in this influx, um, then it's actually an advantage for chromosomal resistance. Um, so the takeaway from this is that this uh, local adaptation explanation for why certain genes are on plasmids only works under the assumption uh, that there isn't a gene-free version um, of the plasmid. Um, so we've sort of um, questioned one explanation for why uh, genes are on plasmids. Um, so can we come up with an alternative hypothesis? Um, and here, um, it's interesting to look at this second effect where the uh, eventual outcome in the model depends on the initial frequency uh, of 
chromosomal versus uh, plasmid borne resistance. Um, so the higher the initial frequency of one form of resistance, um, uh, the, the higher, sorry, I'm hearing some background noise. Ah. Um, the higher the, the fitness um, of that form of resistance. So this is uh, something known as positive frequency dependent uh, selection. Um, and the intuition for uh, why this occurs has to do with this low fitness of cells that have uh, the dual both forms of resistance. So uh, to gain an intuition for this, consider a, a cell with chromosomal resistance that is attempting to invade a population with plasmid borne resistance. What's going to happen to this cell is that it's going to be, um, be uh, susceptible to invasion by a plasmid carrying uh, the resistance gene. And then it will have this dual form of resistance, meaning that it will have low fitness uh, because it has to pay uh, this dual cost uh, and therefore um, be outcompeted. Um, so the intuition is the same for the other way around for um, plasmid borne resistance trying to invade a population with chromosomal resistance. Um, the key idea is that these dual forms of resistance will always be generated. And for the rarer form of resistance, these dual, uh, dually resistant cells uh, will um, be a larger proportion of the overall frequency of that form of resistance. Um, so in this context, being rare is a fitness disadvantage, giving rise to positive frequency dependence. It should be ending now. You ah. have, you've spoken 22 minutes already. Okay, Sorry. I will wrap up. Uh, so um, this, uh, these results are um, very robust to specifics of model structure. They're also robust to having movement uh, between of the gene between the plasmid and the chromosome, uh, and they're robust to having fluctuating antibiotic selection instead of constant selection. The thing that these results are sensitive to is the assumption that dual resistance, so having both forms of resistance, is disadvantageous. Uh, so, so far I've presented, I've talked about having to pay the cost of resistance twice. We can relax that a little bit, so it doesn't need to be uh, exactly twice the cost of resistance, but as soon as dual resistance becomes beneficial, then the population just, th those dually resistant cells outcompete the rest of the population. So this gives rise to this hypothesis that maybe resistance genes are on plasmids because they arrive on plasmids. Um, because once one form of resistance has had the time to be established in the population, it cannot be outcompeted uh, by the other form of resistance. Um, and so because um, transfer rates of plasmids are higher than the transfer rates of chromosomal genes, one estimate is 10 to the seven times higher. Um, we suggest that perhaps the gene location of um, resistance genes is explained by these higher acquisition rates. Um, and so we've done some modeling uh, that supports this, additional modeling that supports this, but I don't have the time to go into that. Um, so just to summarize, why are some genes on plasmids? Uh, we've seen that this local adaptation explanation works, but only if we assume there is no gene but free version of the plasmids. Uh, and for moderately beneficial genes, um, positive frequency dependent selection means that an established form of resistance is difficult to displace. Under these circumstances, uh, gene location is determined by the acquisition rates. And so this rises gives rise to the hypothesis that plasmid-borne genes are moderately beneficial, rarely acquired de novo, and um, shared between multiple species, because under those circumstances, um, the effects of horizontal 
uh, transfer are particularly important. Um, and so our suggestion is that perhaps uh, resistance genes are unplasmids because they fulfill uh, these criteria. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd like to say thank you to the collaborators on this work, uh, Jana Huisman and Sebastian Bonhoeffer. Uh, this was published in Evolution Letters uh, last year. And then more recently, we expand on some of these ideas around frequency dependence uh, in this philosophical transactions be uh, a special issue. Uh, thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Sonia. Are there questions for Sonia? Tal Dagan has one, right? Ah, no, it's just, he's, she's just applauding. Okay, I can do that as well. Bonnie, you want to say something? Yes, I, I just wanted to say that uh, this is de novo acquisition. I do not really uh, agree with this assumption because we published uh, 2020 a paper on INC-P1 plasmids that we captured from the rhizosphere, uh, so from the root zone of tomato and lettuce plants, and they have this exactly the same backbone as the R751, but they are free of any resistant genes. So this indicates that, so they have like an integron, but without uh, gene cassettes, and uh, they have IS 1071, but we have even some plasmids that have no acquired genes, but just IS 1071. So this indicates that the plasmids are around there, and they do not necessarily carry uh, the resistant genes. They are just captured when they are needed. Uh, yes, I mean, exactly, like, that's kind of why we wanted to do this work, uh, because um, it was the sort of previous theory that had started with this assumption that the gene-free versions of the plasmids don't exist. Uh, so we wanted, really wanted to look at, because I agree with you, like, there is evidence that these gene-free versions of plasmids are around. So we wanted to um, do modeling that included the possibility of having those plasmids, exactly. Somebody else? I, I have a question uh, or, or a comment, I don't know. Uh, and is that in my, my recollection of things, uh, genes are on plasmids, adaptive genes, because they are required just from time to time. So in a population only sometimes there is selection for the plasmid. Uh, and then in your, your models, it's always kind of a, a just one uh, environmental condition, right? That you're modeling. But this is not real life. So I think, I think antibiotic resistances are on plasmids because most of the time the bacteria are not uh, challenged by the antibiotic so that they don't require. And the cost of that is, uh, is and unacceptable. But when there is resistance, the plasmid comes. So you can have plasmids going down to say one in eight, 10 to the eight cells in a population, if not required, and suddenly comes up to one if, the, if there is selection. So is, is how do you say, see that? And, uh, uh, because yes, if I mean it's that, there's no, uh, need for all this model in your doing? So uh, it is certainly a, a good point. Um, <laughs> and it is true. So you can, so if you look at the effects of fluctuating selection mm -hmm. under some conditions um, that does um, select for uh, genes that are present on plasmids. However, under some other condition, it selects for um, genes that are present on the chromosome. So mm -hmm. I think uh, that intuition 
is, is one that I share, but I think it's a more complicated story. Um, so we've been doing some work uh, on this with a master's student, but um, so I would say, yes, I agree to some extent, but I think the, the story is more complicated and the effects are relatively minor. Um, but it's something that we're actively investigating. Okay, thank you. Sam, you wanted to ask something? Yeah. Uh, I've last question, it has to be the last question because we are late already. Okay, I'll hurry up. Um, uh, I've been fluctuating my hand up and down because I can't quite work out if my question makes any sense. Um, the well, first thing is, what happens if you invert your thing and you, you say actually it's advantageous to have both resistances because there's a, a dosage effect, and so two copies is worth more. What happens to the system? So then, then that is what gets selected for. So yeah, that's is something that we explored, and if uh, it becomes advantageous to um, have both resistances, then uh, the cells that with both resistances outcompete the others. So there's no bi stability anymore. It's um. Uh, no, so then it's just the ones that have both versions are stable. And okay, thank you, uh, Sonia. We have to go uh, ahead, and we have um, the last speaker before the break, who is uh, 